All right, so we're recording this. Um, we will share the link to it a little bit later and then we'll post it on our YouTube channel as well. So feel free to share it with your networks. Um, our hope for today is really to inspire positive change and to think about solutions to difficult issues that can help all of us who are outdoors, whether that's um, employees, whether it's um, employers, whether it's guides, outfitters, et cetera, people who just want to get outside and recreate. And um, we really do want this to bring about some positive change. So like I said, share it with your networks. Um, because we are recording, we are going to keep everybody on mute. So if we haven't muted you yet, we will be. Just keep an eye out for that. Um, and we're going to keep people on, cute, on mute even during the Q&A. So just know um, this slide shows you how to use the chat. If you're not familiar with it, this is how we will be conducting the Q&A today. Um, it's going to begin probably just a little bit after 9.15, but you can type your questions into the chat before that um, if you'd like to. Um, and then just keep yourself on mute. Otherwise, we'll put you back on mute. Um, that's it for housekeeping today. Um, so I'm very excited to introduce our panelists, Maria, Dave, and Kitty. Dr. Maria Blevins is an associate professor of communication at Utah Valley University. Her research focuses on conflict and organizational and environmental communication. Before becoming an academic, she was a whitewater rafting guide on the New Gali and Snake Rivers. She has a passion for helping people enjoy rivers and the outdoors. Her current research focuses on sexual harassment in the whitewater rafting industry. She's also one of the founding members of ADASH, an anti-discrimination organization for river professionals through the River Management Society. And I think that she'll be talking just a little bit about that in her presentation. Uh, she received her BS in outdoor recreation management from the University of Maine and Machias, MA in communication and a certificate in alternative dispute resolution for natural resources from the University of Montana and her PhD from the University of Utah. So welcome, Maria. Our next panelist will be David Amaralt. Um, he's also known as Digi Dave. Um, he's a marketer with over 20 years of experience in the outdoor industry. It all began at the age of 16, where he annoyed the marketing team at Sunday River via their message long enough for them to give in and bring him on as an intern. Using the skills he learned in Maine, he then went to work at Free Skier Magazine, Aspen Snowmass, Sierra at Tahoe, and most recently Snowbird, where he was the director of marketing. Dave has launched many award-winning and innovative campaigns, including podcasts, ride-sharing and transportation apps, community-driven action sports websites, and resort media campaigns. But let's be honest, most of you know him for Snowbird's one-star ads. Welcome, Dave. And our last panelist will be Kitty Thompson. Kitty is the director of employee experience for CMH Heli Skiing and Summer Adventures based in Banff, Alberta, with 11 backcountry lodges loaded, located in remote regions of British Columbia. CMH is the leading employer in the heli skiing field with over 120 ski guides and more than 300 seasonal staff. Kitty's approach to human resources is defined by an uncommon passion for life and deeply held belief in human equality, dignity, and right to opportunity. Her work has increasingly focused on organizational culture with an emphasis on creating safe and empowering spaces for all employees. Kitty holds a CHRP designation, received her Bachelor of Music from Wilfrid Laurier University, Master's in Adult Education from the University of Calgary, and a post-degree certificate in education, or excuse me, organizational coaching from the University of British Columbia. Welcome, Kitty. And I'm going to start with Maria. Um, give us an overview of your research, if you don't mind. Um, let us know kind of what sparked your interest in researching this um, and some major points that you found out about sexual harassment and negotiating gender in the whitewater rafting world. And the present now should just be toward the bottom of your screen. Great. And did you upload that PowerPoint or do I need to? I will go ahead and share it from my screen. If you want to just start talking a little bit about your background and I'll get that up. Absolutely. Thanks. So uh, you heard in my introduction, I before I was an ac academic, I uh, was a whitewater rafting guide and it was a job that I loved. I did it for 12 years, sort of on a lot of different rivers. And um, uh, it's like a integral part of my identity, even though it's not part of my job anymore. I still am an active river runner and um, feel like the skills I learned as a guide um, have served me well through, throughout other careers. And um, so this project was inspired in 2015 when a group of female employees at Grand Canyon National Park came together and um, wrote a letter to then Secretary of Interior, Sally Jewell, and they outlined years and years of sexual assault and harassment um, 
from the river rangers. And not only um, were the, the acts that were described um, like a real bummer, uh, there was also just organizational denial and inability to report what was happening to other folks. And so, um, perfect. Maybe just to the next slide. Um, and so this got a real conversation started through some articles in outdoor magazines. Um, my friends and I were talking about it that were part of the river community. And um, we kind of came to the conclusion that even though we read these reports and were pretty horrified by them, a lot of the behaviors sort of were the norm or what was expected in the river community. So that got me really curious about what was happening and what the consequences of that were. Do you mind switching to the next slide? Perfect. So this inspired me to do a project. Um, I'm a qualitative researcher, so I've done an ethnography, which basically means I'm using observation and interviews to gather stories and experiences of people um, that have been raft guides. So I did a participant observation. Um, I went to a lot of river festivals. I've run rivers. I've hung out um, at guide companies, uh, on, on the shuttle vehicles, in the in the bars or by the river afterwards. Um, I did 55 interviews with people that have worked on rivers throughout the US and the world, um, both day trips and multi-day trips. And the next slide. And I feel like this quote that came up really gives a good start to, to my research. Um, one of the people I interviewed said there was this sign hanging on the guide room when you walked into check-in um, for your trip. And it was sexual harassment will not be reported, but it will be graded. And so I feel like that sort of sets the tone for a lot of the kind of fun party or, or idea, and I use the word fun, it's not necessarily fun for everyone, um, that, that the idea about sexual harassment is. So the next slide, just if um, some of you have probably worked in the river community, I think it's similar. You know, I've also worked at ski resorts and I know our other presenters are in the ski industry. Often the people that work as guides then go work in the, in the ski industry, but it's a unique working environment. And the next slide, I think gives a really nice quote that explains um, it. Amelia said, what makes this job different? Everything. I mean, it would be like if you went to the office from nine to five and then everyone from your office came home with you and you all made dinner together and then you had to sleep over in your living room three feet from each other. And then you did that for six days in a row or 14 days in a row without really seeing anyone else or interacting or engaging with anyone else. So really, especially multi-day guiding, it's really you're on two four seven in a way that I don't think you are in a normal workplace. So you're working together, you're living together, you're recreating together, you're maybe dating each other. I mean, it is like your whole life is in, in one place. Next slide. I did ask, do you see sexual harassment as an issue here or do you see it happen? And um, three of the answers, I mean, Tim said effing millions. And no, I can't remember them all millions, probably 65 today minimum. Will said, yeah, yeah, every day. And Elizabeth said, you know, every day, like a thousand times a day. So almost everyone I talked to was like, yeah, this is not like an environment that has an HR department and strictly enforced um, rules about sexual harassment. Um, you, it's just part of, part of what happens. The next slide, um, we'll talk a little bit about one of my surprise findings was um, almost every person um, that I interviewed, it didn't matter your gender, um, said that they had either witnessed or an experience in ex uh, time with a customer where they were really um, disappointed that they had a female raft guide. And so um, that was one surprise. The next slide gives a quote I think that ties, really describes this well. Alma said, at the top of Big Rapids, I feel it a lot where people are choosing boats and I feel like a really competent rower. And yet I still feel like people from the outside are so ready to look at that tall bearded man before they look at me. And there's this instance of being on the river and our baggage butter had never been down this river before, but he was six feet tall and wearing flannel and has this full big beard. And these customers are like, we want to be in that guy's boat. And I'm like, okay, he has a beard, but I've been reading water for 15 years. I have 4,000 commercial miles and I've been down this river three or four times a season. Yeah, I'm five foot three, but I'm a little more qualified than that taller man. So that really summarizes the next slide. I just took this um, portrait of sort of an old timey boatman by Paula McHugh. We imagine the outdoor person to often be a man, to be a white man, to be beardy. If you're familiar with Finney's work, um, 
uh, black faces and white spaces, she really goes into, we have this idea, right, of um, Muir or Thoreau or Ed Abbey out in the woods and they're big and they're beardy. And so when the guide um, comes to do this sort of scary experience and they're confronted with a body that doesn't look like what they expect, it can be sort of surprising. So that was my first finding was that um, customers were like one of the, the difficult um, challenges that guides had. The next thing I want to talk about is I specifically asked what strategies are people using to negotiate these. And I just chose the key example from each of these themes. These are not all of the things I found, but I think that they really summarize um, what people that might not fit that stereotype of guide, what they're doing to fit in. So the first slide um, talks about you have to be tough. So John said, I think river guides and outdoor folks in general, as you know, usually don't bring the softest people. So they're pretty, the Women that I've worked with are pretty tough women. They're pretty great. So thin skin doesn't usually last too long in this guide world. So a lot of my results were like, well, if you can't hack it, if it doesn't feel fun to you, this isn't going to be the place for you. The next strategy um, is humor. So Crystal outlined, uh, or her quote was, I definitely think that just starting to dish it back at the guys, if they sort of harass me, not that I would necessarily sexually harass them back, but I would tell dirty jokes and I would just laugh at the lewd remarks. So um, a lot of the people just said, you just have to be funny, you have to roll with it, you have to laugh a lot. And that humor often, in the next slide, um, presents in a really crass way. So the next strategy that a lot of women outlined was to be crass. So Brent described it, some of the girls have worth, worse mouths than any male I've ever heard in my life. Of course they're accepted quicker, quicker because all the guys think they're more fun. You're not walking on eggshells around them in what you can say. And so it's this idea that like, if I can be even naughtier or like more offensive than the fellas, maybe they can't, they will like not notice I'm a woman or not, you know, not harass me in a way. Um, the next strategy I think we've seen from a lot of um, women, they report this in, in multiple industries, but you have to be really good at the job. Um, so Emily says, so it forces you to basically be perfect. You know, like the guys, they can do stuff like make a mistake or something and it was just laughed about. But if a girl makes the same mistake, it's like they aren't, they aren't confident. So a woman in a job like that, I think you have to be perfect. You have to hold yourself to a higher standard than the guys. So being good at the job is the next strategy. Um, the next one outlined is uh, what's often in the literature called a whisper network. I kind of like to call it the whisper sisters, although I think men also often do this. You sort of know the creeper in your organization and you warn people about them. So Amelia um, outlined this as, you know who's not above board, you know who not to hang around with, you know who not to be alone with. That existed. There were people and they were like, don't go on an overnight by yourself with them. And that's not cool because it means that someone else had to learn that lesson. So um, people sort of warning each other about bad actors. And then the last strategy that I identified is that they leave, right? This isn't an environment that they feel like they can thrive in. So Gretchen says they all leave. Uh, none of those badass women I'm referring to, with the exception of one, but most of the women left. In part, it's a part of their life that they love um, and they're glad they did it, but you're just surrounded by man children. So that's what Gretchen said. So the last thing that came up in my um, research that I wanna talk after strategies is reporting and um, almost, uh, only one um, participant that I talked to said that they clearly understood who they would report to in their organization if they did have an incident come up. So this next quote, um, I think says it well, I had asked, hey, who would you report something to? And Alma said, that's a great question because you're saying that and I realize I don't know how to report. So that was like a big organizational um, thing that I think can be easily addressed is is creating a reporting system. So with all of my findings, I do have a few suggestions. Um, I hate when people just identify problems. Um, so my first, my first suggestion on the next slide is um, really think about that reporting system. So in most of the participants, like I said, reporting systems were non-existent or they were hard to navigate. So if you lead an organization or you're thinking about how to design a reporting system, um, think about what systems exist. Could they be easier to navigate? Who are the people you report to? And um, are some of those people women or non-binary people? Is there a diverse array of folks to report to? Some people said like, oh, I don't want to go report to that manager. They're like the person sexually harassing me. So do you have a few places that you can go um, for that? Um, the next suggestion that I have on the next slide is um, to have some 
honest conversations in your organizations about what your culture could look like. And this is difficult to do. Um, I think a big part is talking about consent. So, I mean, I really liked working in the river community because I like telling jokes and I like being like a little bit, uh, like a little bit body, but, um, you know, if it's not fun and if someone can't say like, this isn't fun for me, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, then, then they're probably going to leave or they're going to feel uncomfortable. So what does consent look like? And can people in your organization say, Hey, I don't, I don't want to do this right now. And then, um, last, do you have individuals in your organization that you are warning people about? And if that's the case, are you disciplining these people? Are you, um, helping them maybe, navigate things differently, or should they be invited to leave your organization? If you have sort of known people that you warn new individuals about, why, why is that the case? Why would you keep them around? Um, next slide is a few more suggestions. Uh, I talked through quickly what these strategies are, and um, they don't necessarily mean that you have a bad culture, but if you notice that like a lot of the women at your company are super crass, you might want to think about like, hey, is there this, um, organizational culture where people feel like they have to act a certain way or, um, you know, maybe ask, ask folks like, Hey, I see you like being really tough. Is that, is there a reason for that? So these could just be ways that you could think about as an ally, how to do things differently. And the next slide is, um, you can train your, your guides to, um, Maybe have one liners that they come back to customers. So if you're dealing with your customers, also letting your customers know that they can be banned from a company. They, you can ask them to leave a trip. Um, have some training around the TLs on how to handle a customer that's harassing a guide. And maybe even have your customers sign a code of conduct. I've heard of some RAF companies that are having folks say like, hey, this is how I'm going to behave on a river trip. And the last slide that I leave you with is... Um, Ask yourself about what bodies are we expecting in the outside. Um, do you have groups that you joke about when they come as customers, right? So thinking about gender, thinking about race, thinking about all sorts of things. Are we not? Are we? Are we gonna like build an expectation of who might be coming outside more than just like that tall man with a beard? And then I would just ask yourself about a fun working environment. Is it fun for everyone? Is an important question. Um, India mentioned the next slide. We uh, I've joined with some people under the River Management Society to create a dash. We have a very newly created website here, and we um, are offering support to folks that might want to look at their organizational culture. So if you are interested in this, or just want a little support, or um, want to want to join, we're we're still creating and we're looking to build a awesome environment. So the next slide just has my email address. I'm happy to um, answer any questions. My research is a lot more in depth than this, and I. Just really appreciate this invitation to talk. Thank you so much, Maria. Really appreciate it. Um, and like I said, if you have questions, sorry, I've had my screen totally hidden. So if you have questions, you can start typing them into the chat. We'll get to those a little bit later. Um, and then I will send out all this information as well as any slide decks that the presenters are comfortable with me sharing so that you've got contact information and whatnot. Um, with that, let me go ahead. Um, Dave, I wanna kind of prompt a question your way. Um, what steps do you think we can take to make sure the outdoor industry is friendlier to members of the LGBT community? And I know you've got some slides as well. <laughs> I am glad you asked. Yeah, and I'll, um, we'll, we'll show you my screen right now. Hold on one second. So if, if we're good here, um, India, thanks. Thanks for that. I wanted to first give you guys um, a little bit of, I'd say what I've been through and some of the, the nasty things, and then I'll let you know what I think are some steps as marketers we can take to make the industry a little bit more inclusive to everyone. So the title of this is kind of like, it's not always rainbows because you know here's kind of the, the gnarly side of it. Um, I don't need to give you the intro or the information about, we already know that. Um, this will be available um, after my presentation offline if you guys wanna share it. So I do give a little backstory here. Um, so what I'm gonna be covering is my story um, what I went through and then being a bit more inclusive uh, as marketers and some key takeaways that you can bring back to people that you work with. So I hid who I was for the overwhelming majority of my career. I came out at the age of 36. Um, there, there are three big reasons why I didn't come out. There was absolutely no one else um, in these small little mountain town communities that I worked in um, and of anyone in the LGBTQ community. Maybe there were one or two people, but, but that was it. Dating pool non-existent. 
people in leadership positions, once again, non-existent. Second is the ski industry is a bit of a boys club. It's overwhelmingly white and male and things that I've heard in meetings would make your skin crawl. Um, these kind of actions don't exactly foster a welcoming environment for LGBTQ people. And if I was out, would I be welcome at the table? And then the other issue was my next job. And I remember someone on the leadership team in Aspen saying, after I came out, you know, congratulations, you know, but why, why weren't you comfortable um, here? At, at the, and Aspen's an amazing company for inclusiveness and, and there actually are people of LGBTQ backgrounds there, but I was always worried about my next job. Would the next ski resort I worked at or my next employer be as friendly? And would me being out hinder my ability to advance my career? Um, and then I wanted to give you a statistic, and this is that fewer than 0.3% of Fortune 500 board directors are openly LGBTQ in 2020. Now imagine that for leadership positions in the ski industry. Like, if you work in, in that industry, do you know anyone in a leadership position that is actively out? Uh, I can't think of many people, and I know most people. So I came out the way that you would expect me to do with, with, on social media on the last day of Pride Month, well, a lot of fanfare. I'm a marketer, so of course I did a coordinated push across all my social channels. I received a lot of support from friends, family, and the internet was incredibly heartwarming. I got hundreds of comments of support um, and messages from other people in the ski industry that were worried about coming out, asking for advice, and honestly just looking for someone to talk to. Um, that hit home for me because I never had anyone that I could communicate with and then and I've actually made some great friendships from people um, that are now inside or outside the industry that have come out or um, you know just needed a, a shoulder to lean on or an ear to bend. Um, so what happened after I came out? Well a thousand people on Instagram unfollowed me so that was cool but my take on that is good riddance I don't need them but then the really sad stuff started happening. Um, People started trying to uh, destroy my my SEO. So they started posting fraudulent stories of on-campus behavior at my last employer to get me in trouble at work, manipulate my search engine results pages, and essentially try to assassinate my character. Um, I had to set up a bunch of Google alerts and just worry every morning that I would wake up and the first email I saw was from Google that something else hideous had been said about me online that was completely untrue. Um, and these people followed me on Instagram. If I traveled somewhere, they post a new story. So like if I went and skied the weekend at Big Sky or Aspen, they would post, watch out, this scumbag is in Big Sky or Aspen. And this just kept happening. They would screen grab my Instagram stories and post on these gossip websites and just try to destroy my SEO. Then my phone number was leaked and I would get harassing messages on my phone. No idea how they got my phone number, but they got it. So I'll spare you some of the more graphic stuff, but here's just some weird shady things that would come in via iMessage. And of course it's a virtualized phone number set up from an internet provider. So I would go to town as Digi Dave, finding out their provider and killing their accounts for acceptable use policy violations because I'm a nerd and I know how to do that. And then I started being impersonated on Facebook. And you know, these people are lazy when they can't even get my public details right. Like I didn't go to Boulder High or University of Utah. Come on guys. So they were actually doing this to sell fraudulent camera equipment. And then the really gnarly thing was they were spinning up profiles on dating apps that needed Facebook authentication and images. And what they were doing on those apps was pretty heinous. Somehow they got a copy of my driver's license. So they were also using this to pretend to be me on auction websites and sell things and pretend to be me, which was just pretty horrible. And this is where I got gnarly. I, I, I got a lot of threats and like DMs from fake accounts saying that people were gonna come to my house, physically harm me, kill my dog. But I always assume those are just kind of empty threats and the internet hate machine kind of doing its thing. But when they started trying to coerce my ex-boyfriend to reveal my home address, that's why I knew things got real. Um, so yeah, that that's that's not fun. And then there's just a lot of this shit that I say. You just get a, a constant barrage of crappy comments said the online. Um, the overwhelming majority of people in this industry and their customers are kind and nice people. But that small percentage, they're vocal and they'll say heinous things to you. 
Um, and did I bring this up with my employer? Yeah. Yeah, I did. The second I found out that people were trying to slander me um, and say things were happening on campus, I did. And what was the response? It wasn't good. Um, it was something along the lines of, well, this is your problem because it's you're on social media. That's not a great way to respond to it. You know, so I had, I had to deal with this uh, every morning, every day, every week. Just what, what's next coming at me every time I open my phone or open my inbox. So Lindy asked, what can we do to make the outdoor industry friendlier to the LGBTQ community? So here's a couple of things from a marketing perspective, what I think we can do um, to help improve this. Um, diversify or include diversity in your marketing collateral. Lead by example. Promote LGBT inclusiveness in the collateral. Place our community on equal footing across your platforms. Don't just reserve it for targeted products or promotions. We all know marketers can target. You don't need to target us with this type of messaging. Make it part of the entire landscape that you do. I know it might be hard. You might not know people that you can feature, but you have to try and it's 100% doable. Delta does a phenomenal job at this. I know no one's flying right now, but if, if you do fly and you go walk down one of their jetways, they have these posters hung up. Um, and there are people of color, people of the LGBTQ community, families. It is awesome. It's great to see. Um, and then this is from Mountain Creek Ski Area in New Jersey. Yes, there is skiing in New Jersey, and it's awesome. I promise you. Um, this was a Facebook post that they made a few weeks ago. And when I when I talked to Hugh, the director of marketing, he said, we're just trying to be good, good humans, which I think is an awesome way to approach this. Just be good humans, do what's right. Um, so this is, this is a great engagement post on top of their mountain from some of their employees. Now, as you can imagine, when you post stuff like this, the internet hate machine starts to churn. Um, so you're gonna come face to face with this when your brand supports stuff like this. Stand up to it, ban hateful messages, ban them on your platforms, control it. If it's Facebook, Instagram, vlog comments, use that nuke button. Um, and it's okay to fire these customers. You don't want people like this being your customer. You don't want them frequenting your resort property. You don't want them interacting with the rest of your guest audience. Bye, Felicia. And then support local events in the LGBTQ community. You have to lead by example. Promote inclusiveness in the collateral. Place a community on your, oops, that's a different slide. But anyway, um, you know, show up, help share people's stories. Everyone is in this industry because of our love for the outdoors. But the way that the LGBTQ community experiences things are different. They have different travel experiences, advice, and stories to tell. So please feature them. And then you have to realize no one's perfect, but you should always be improving. Um, Build it from within and make it a part of your culture. You gotta communicate, find ways to continually get that message across for your brand's commitment to inclusiveness. Do it in your employee onboarding, newsletters. Don't pander like, or perpetuate stereotypes. We can see that from a mile away. Build the culture from within and it'll reflect in your products and services. And then get resources. If, if you're an ally, but you are still like, don't understand the acronym suit, it's totally fine. There are plenty of reputable online sources that are going to help you understand the terms uh, and know the best practices. There's another slide here for additional resources where I give you guys some links for that. And then set policies. Set clear policies prohibiting harassment and discrimination. I love the idea of a code of conduct. Um, think about extending your employee benefits to LGBTQ communities and partnerships. Um, and then this is that list of additional resources that I'll link. I'll share all this on my social channels. If you don't follow me, it's at OZ Skier. You can just Google search my name and you'll find me on any platform, um, but thanks. Thanks so much, Dave. All right, Kitty, you are going to be our last presenter before we open up to questions. Um, thank you for everyone in the chat who was, who was thanking Maria for her presentation. Um, Kitty, I have got a, a question for you. Um, please tell us about your role at CMH Heli Skiing and Summer Adventures and what has been successful and created a positive and safe environment for your clients and employees. Um, it's, I think it's, it's really interesting. Sure, and I'll just um, put it out there. This is a very tough time slot to have because these are some pretty amazing presenters that have gone before me. I am but one organization um, that is on a journey. Um, and I think, you know, CMH is an organization that's midway through a journey that I believe is headed in the right direction. So I like to think of us as a success in progress. Um, I'm immensely proud of the work that we've taken. 
Are we at the finish line? No. Will we ever be? Who knows? Will the world keeps changing? Um, but I do think that we've, we've made some great strides and, um, and I'm, I'm really proud of that. You know, as Maria talked about, like, everything in her presentation rang true with uh, the things that I hear from, from our female guides um, throughout the guiding industry in Canada. Um, you know, it's a very male dominated space. Um, and then heli skiing is an even, you know, a male dominated space within a male dominated space. Um, and, you know, it, there's behaviors that have become normalized over time that weren't healthy. Um, and mostly be, it's because people of a different gender were merely ex, you know, excluded from that space. So there wasn't a concern. And I think there's multiple levels of impact. We have our female guides that it heavily impacts. You know, when Maria was talking about being discriminated against because you're a woman, you know, the two things I hear are, um, I, I hear that I don't want, uh, the guest doesn't want to pick a female guide because they're not as competent or the opposite, which is just as bad. I want the hot one, um, which completely diminishes their skills. We also have a lot of female staff and we, we're also in that 24 seven world. Our backcountry lodges are flying. You're there for seven days. You're eating with guests. Um, you're sharing spaces with guests. We often have female staff that uh, might be young in our hospitality positions. Um, there's a power dynamic with the, the wealthy male guests that come to our spaces. And then we also have this idea of the, the new market of female guests and creating spaces that those women who are going to be sort of high net worth female um, guests, do they want to come into this space and will they feel safe and, and welcome there? So some of the things that we did, we, we identified the problem areas. I think it's, it's, nature to want to look at your culture and say it's beautiful there's no problems um and so you know that knowing is the first step was really important for us um and just having the courage to go and look in the dirty corners and say what are our problems and let's surface these and let's talk about them and it wasn't easy at first to get everyone to recognize there even were problems some of the behaviors were so normalized and people had no experience uh, with the other side of it that they just frankly couldn't see what the big problem was so a lot of our work was around pulling out specific examples from our culture and the language that was being used to really show people how that language impacts others. And that idea of changing the narrative um, from you're killing all the fun to we're making it fun for everyone. And then doing the work, and this has come in stages. We partnered with Outward Bound, um, I have partnered with Outward Bound for several years. Um, doing programs with them up at our lodges. And in exchange, they offered their services to come and work with our management team several years ago. Um, and we all went up to our one of our lodges and we surfaced a lot of the damaging behaviors that were happening. And out of that, we created what we call the human snowpack manual. And this was a resource that we used in our employee experience department to train staff um, on respectful communication, building safe relationships, understanding the progression from stereotypes to problematic language to problematic behavior to possible you know assault level behaviors um, and then how intoxication changes our behaviors because again we have you know guests and staff that are at the same bar at night interacting so that was sort of step one Beyond that, we started to realize that we needed to get some help from the outside. So we engaged with the Center for Sexuality in Calgary to come in and do what they called active bystander training. And this took it beyond just explaining what harassment is and actually giving people tools to handle it when it either happened to them or seeing it happen to somebody else. Um, and so that really built the sense of allyship among our lodge um, and staff. The guides are the, I think that the area that has the biggest impact because they not only do we do we see a lot of problematic behaviors um, on the on the female guides, but they have the most impact on our guests in a lot of ways because they are the leaders that are out in the field. And so one of the big pushes we made was to bring this topic to guides training, which is predominantly a room of males. We have a guiding team of about 130 professional ski and mountain guides and about 25 of those are women. So this was a big target group and we brought in a speaker a while back by the name of Rachel Reimer and she's a PhD candidate um, with a backcountry skiing um, history. And she's doing research and exploring workplace experiences um, around diversity, inclusion and resilience in the avalanche work, uh, sorry, avalanche space and, and guiding. 
And I thought this was a really interesting person to bring in because she spoke the language of her people. So she could, she could, she could speak to our guides and help them understand um, the space of inclusion and diversity while comparing things to snowpack. Um, and I think that was one of the really important things is to, is to find somebody that speaks the language of your people. If you bring in somebody that has this sort of corporate speak of harassment, people just roll their eyes and they move away. When you bring somebody into the space, like Rachel or somebody like Maria that's been there, I think it adds credibility to that conversation. CMH has gone one step further and we've actually partnered with Rachel um, in her research. And so we will be one of the participating organizations in her qualitative research um, to understand their experience working at CMH. And I think as a leader, this was a really important step for us, but it's also a really scary step because you're putting yourself out there and you don't know what is going to come back out of that research. But again, you know, if knowing is the first step, we need to know what that experience is before we can do anything about it. And then I think the last piece was holding everybody accountable to our values. Um, about four years ago now, we, we reset our, our core values for CMH. Um, and we got together with our leadership team and we spent uh, several days with a facilitator. Um, and we've, we've really imprinted those everywhere in our culture. Um, they hang on the walls, they're embedded into our performance reviews, they're embedded into our corrective actions. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a set of values that we use to guide our business um, decisions each day. And we needed to have that for everyone to get on board. Um, and so not only do we use that to keep our staff accountable for their interactions with each other, but we also use it to keep our guests accountable with our staff. Um, and we have a, a zero tolerance policy with our guests. Um, and you know, as the speakers before mentioned, um, it's, it's important to be able to, to fire your clients. Um, and we have actually banned a few guests who just weren't able to get on board. Now I will put that in context that we're talking about maybe four people over a season that has thousands of guests. So the majority of people are fantastic. But the problem is, is it only takes one case of sexual harassment each year to have a damaging effect on a human. Um, and so even if it's one or two people that you say, no, thank you, your money is not welcome here, um, it's, it's a big deal. Um, and I, I encourage people to take that mindset. Um, it costs money, um, but it just encouraged us to do better business um, and, and not worry about that lost revenue. And then what are we doing going forward? We're just going to keep repeating the cycle, identify issues, do something about it, hold everyone accountable. Um, it just keeps rolling. Um, and, and every time we do something, every time we deal with a harassment case, um, we, we do a better job. We learn something about how we did it. Um, and then we improve on that. I, I try to live by the Maya Angelou uh, quote of, you know, do, do the best you can till sorry, do the best you can do until you know better. And then when you know better, do better. And I think that's really important. We can, we can get hung up on trying to be perfect in this space. And what's important is that we keep evolving and we keep learning and growing, um, not that we do it perfectly the first time. That's it for me. Thank you so much, Kitty. Um, I, Anyone's welcome to go ahead and start um, putting questions into the chat box if you have any questions. Um, I was going to actually open it up to um, all three speakers and, and ask if what advice you have for your peers in the industry um, to make it safer or happier for clients, coworkers, guests, everyone involved. Um, I think all of you actually did a really great job answering that already. Um, so it looks like we. I, if, if definitely if anyone wants to jump in on that and add something else, you're welcome to, but we did just get a couple questions in that I will go ahead and, and pose. Um, first of all, Maria, um, what level of responsibility to guides have to introduce and ask for sexual slash discrimination support? Um, I, I hope I'm understanding the question correctly, but um, there's some really interesting research about when you ask someone what they're going to do when they're being harassed, like 99% of the people are like, I'd get out of there. I would tell them to buzz off. But then like when it's, when they actually look at what's happening in the moment, not a lot of people can do that. So, you know, I, I think um, it's two ways, right? Management needs to be able to make it super clear that if a guy needs support that they can come to them. Um, 
there's Kitty really talked about how there's like dynamics of power and there's dynamics of um, of you know you're like hoping for a tip from that customer or you're a first or second year guide and you're uh, and this person's the trip leader. So you know I I think um, it's a two way. It, it's really great if guides are empowered to ask for that support, but they need to know that they're going to be supported in asking for that support. So I hope I answered that question. Thank you. And I will also say, just because I know we are getting short on time, if we don't get to all of the questions, um, we can you can message them to us and we can get them to the speakers or we can we can pass out some information. Um, looks like let me scroll up a bit. Um, Dave, what is a good route, a better route for an employer to take in a situation such as yours? I think having empathy and understanding as to what people are going through is, is a good route to take. This is hard stuff. And it's it's hard to bring up with people, right? It it took me a long time to like even tell friends about what was happening to me in a lot of these cases. So if if this kind of stuff gets brought up to you, maybe ask, how are you doing? <laughs> Not here's the company line on this. People have emotions and feelings. This is tough stuff. Have some empathy with them. I think that's that's just be a human being at a bare minimum. I think that's a great lead into this this other question. As a manager slash trainer of a ski school, what can I do to make sure my employees know they can always come to me for harassment or personal issues? I've had it happen as they, well, that there's there's your question, and I'll pose that to all three of you. I love uh, and, and instructor Zom, you're the man, by the way. He's follow this guy on social media. He's a reason why the the future of the ski industry looks bright. Um, Z, what I would say is just always be present and communicative to your staff and people around you that you are open to anything. You're an ally. They can they they should be able to bring anything to you that is hindering their ability to do their job, communicate with guests, or provide amazing levels of service um, in your ski school. I know that you think about this kind of stuff, man. It's great that you're even here and asking questions. Create that level of community and open dialogue with your employees and, and you should be fine. I would add the suggestion of um, watch out for like, uh, I, I love the advice of making sure that you communicate that you're open to hearing about it, but then also making sure your actions. So, I, you know, I think a lot of times the dynamics is with like senior people that have gotten away with shenanigans for a long time, hold them accountable, you know, so that um, the, the community, uh, expectations are reflected in like maybe n not permitting it, even if it's with like really senior, really respected people. And Kitty, do you have anything else to add to that? Okay, if you do, just feel free to unmute and jump on. Um, so Ali asks, how can we address the imagined biases of customers? Example, we'd love to be inclusive in our marketing slash have more women guides, but it's not what customers want. How do you address that in um, in your marketing and, and, and everything else? You want me to take that one since I'm the marketing guy? Go for it. As a marketer, it's your job to dictate the values of your company and brand. Yeah, they, they might not like it, but that's that's fine. If that's one of the core values and, and beliefs of your company, you communicate it. You don't have to please everyone. And this is how change happens. You know, you see it when resorts post Black Lives Matters posts or anything supporting the LGBTQ community. Some people don't like it, and that's fine. You don't have to please everyone. Be strong and continue the messaging. And I would just add part of my research, I'm doing a content analysis of just looking at like RAF companies, uh, marketing uh, materials and websites. And this really interesting thing I'm noticing, I mean, it's not every company, but um, you, the pictures that are like a boat going into a big gnarly rapid is like a dude RAF guide. And the picture of the like family float with like, the kids splashing and having a great time on a ducky is the female rough guide, like really often. So it can be really small things. You might say, oh, well, our marketing stuff has female guides. Are they doing the big gnarly stuff or are they doing like the family friendly in your in your advertising stuff? 
and Maria, I'm actually going to pull the, the first, very first page of your PowerPoint back up quickly just to give an example. I believe that's you in the picture, correct? It so is gonna, me. It's my worst, worst day of uh, guiding. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just going to start with what a mess I can be. <laughs> let's, let's see. So if you can all see this picture, I hope. There you go. There's an example of what looks like a, a pretty gnarly day, uh, but there's obviously a female guide um, at the front of that, of the front of that raft. So thank you for that. Um, sorry, I'm kind of catching up here. Um, Kitty, do you have anything else to add to that question about um, how do you overcome those, those um, perceived biases? I'm not sure if, if we have lost her, if she just doesn't have, oh, it looks like we did lose her. Okay, so I'm not gonna expect an answer from Kitty there. Um, okay, I actually do wanna open it back up. Hopefully she can, she can jump on here in the next few minutes. I also do realize that we are getting close on time and I know we've got some, some kind of back-to-back -back stuff coming up here. Um, so I do wanna open it back up to my original question too, as, as more questions come into the Q&A. Any additional advice um, for, peers for recreators to make it really um, to make the outdoors really inclusive and welcoming to all and then on that Maria if you want to touch just a bit more about a dash and kind of what the long-term goals are with that that would be terrific and then um, Dave if you know of any organizations that are similar to a dash um, in in not the river management society world um, feel free to, to add those as well Um, I think I would just say you're doing the right things, right? Just by taking your time to be part of this conversation, it's pretty awesome. But I always come back to that question of, you know, is it fun for everyone and who might not it be fun for? And what are the reasons for that? And could you, can you deconstruct some of those barriers? And then also, I mean, I, um, yeah, thinking about how fun can be had where it's like not at someone's expense or, or related around sexuality. And ADASH is just starting, actually, the um, uh, American Outdoors was held in Salt Lake City in December, and a group of us connected at that conference. And um, so we are just beginning, and uh, our website is just up and going. I think our imagining is just to be a place, um, I think Kitty was said how important it is to have someone that like speaks the language of not only the, the like, sexual harassment training, but also the the sport. So it's river enthusiasts that are kind of just looking to change the culture. And I, I think we have some big ideas, but right now we're just starting as a place where companies or agencies can come to get a little support to even start asking these questions. I really like how Kitty described, you have to look in some kind of gnarly dark corners um, of your organization and be sort of honest about what's happening and so we're we're here to maybe help you do that and start some of these really hard conversations to have yeah and i think i'm just going to echo what hugh at mountain creek said like try to be a good human being realize that you might not understand what everyone else is going through but being a good human being at a foundational level will help you communicate with this community and realize that you're not going to have all the answers so ask, like communicate, be open to suggestions and input from everyone, um, and then seek out resources when you need them. Thank you. And I just saw a note from Kitty. So Kitty, I'm gonna kind of go back one question um, to, to see if you have anything to add to this. And then I think that'll just about wrap us up, but just remember, this is recorded. We'll share all this information out um, so you can share it with all of your networks. I know we actually reached capacity on registration, so definitely share it to, to friends. Um, but Kitty, um, how can we address the imagined biases of customers? Example, we'd love to be inclusive in our marketing slash have more women guides, but it's not what our customers want. Uh, Dave and, and Marie gave some really cool answers. I don't think we know what our customers want, and I don't think we know who our future customers are. And that's the thing that I, I, I like to keep in, in my mind. I'm not a marketer, um, but I am, an, I am a people person, and I work with humans. And I know that the guests that we have today are different than the guests that we had in the past. 
And maybe we don't want some of those guests that we had in the past, and maybe they don't want to be more inclusive, and perhaps they can go find a different place to ski. Um, what I do think we want is to find the people that believe in our new message and our updated message about inclusivity. So I think we need to not worry so much about what the current landscape looks like as far as our guest base goes and say, who do we want to be in 50 years? And how do we go and find those people that want to go on that journey with us? Okay, thank you so much. We're gonna go ahead and conclude with that. Hold on one second. Here's a great example. Look at the chat. I also, I did just see a message um, that that person was removed from the meeting. So I think that that was one of one of my colleagues. Okay. Who removed, I, like, I can't did not make type this, that. this up. Yeah. Well, that person's been removed from the meeting. Um, just in time for us to end, um, Kitty and Dave and Maria, thank you all so much for this information, um, sharing your, your professional stories, your personal stories. We really appreciate it. Um, very valuable for the community. And then, like I said, everyone who's on this, feel free to share it out with your networks. Please do. It's an important conversation. And we may be having a, a part two of this in the future. Um, thank you, everyone, so much. Thanks for having me. Bye, everyone.